So let me just extract that last equation. What have we got from a formal point of view? If we, if we cut away all the, the color and the context, we've got a mathematical identity. If you sum k running from 0 through n of a square weighted by a binomial probability, you get n times p times q. Remember, q is 1 minus p. This is our starting point. So, what did we want to estimate? Well, we want to estimate a particular probability. And what is the probability at hand? It is the probability that something bad happens. What is bad in this context? We are given an error tolerance epsilon that we do not wish to exceed. And we want to know what is the probability that the relative frequency of successes, Sn over n, our estimate for p, differs from the true, fixed, but sadly unknown p by more than epsilon. Let's promptly write it down in terms of an event. What is the event? Well, let's clear the denominator by multiplying all terms by n. And so this becomes the probability that in absolute value, the accumulated number of successes, Sn, differs from Np by more than n epsilon. This is the bad thing. Okay. How do we go about computing it? Well, let's, a, fig, a picture will help us, right? So let's draw a picture of a typical binomial distribution. The region around Np in the center, up to n epsilon to the left and n epsilon to the right, is the good region. That's the region where my estimate is within epsilon of the true answer. The region to the left of that and to the right of that, shown red in the figure, is the bad region. All the integers k which land in those regions give rise to bad results. So our event is all integers k to the left of the green region and to the right of the green region. All right. How do we compute this probability? Well, we simply add all the binomial probabilities in that affected region. And here's the notation. Now, this notation looks cumbrous and complex. Right? We have a subscript which looks messy and deep, and this is not the way we usually write sums. Well, what does this mean? This means that we are going to be adding binomial probabilities. And what kinds of binomial probabilities? Remember, n, the number of trials, is fixed. P, the success probability, is fixed, albeit unknown. And so what we're going to do is add over a number of successes k. Over what range? Well, the figure tells us in what looks like the red region. And what is the red region? All those integers k for which k differs from np in absolute value by more than n epsilon. And if we break it down into the two individual pieces, this means that either k is smaller than np minus n epsilon, or that k is larger than np plus n epsilon. Now, here's where a neophyte, or even a person with experience, can spend a lot of time writing out these binomial probabilities, staring at them, attempting to massage them, and hoping against hope that something good will happen. Sadly, such efforts are doomed to failure. That sum is intractable in the sense that there is no simple closed form for it. We're going to have to take a different tack. Here is a seemingly innocuous idea, which doesn't look very promising, but of course, there's going to be a method in the madness. The binomial probabilities of the sum, if multiplied by 1, well, it changes nothing. A binomial probability times 1 is just a self-same binomial probability. Nothing has happened, has it? Hmm. But here is the key idea of Chebyshev. If the term 1 inside the summation is replaced by a number bigger than 1, then all we will have done is increase the value of the sum. Hmm, I wonder if this could be useful. Well, for it to be useful, we're going to have to replace 1 by something creative, something which gives us analytical simplifications. Let us take a look at what the range of values k is over which I'm summing. Remember, I'm summing over those integers k for which 
in absolute value k minus np exceeds n epsilon. If I divide both sides by n epsilon, then this is completely equivalent to saying that the ratio of the absolute value of k minus np to n epsilon is bigger than 1. So we're going to sum over all integers k for which that inequality is true. Or yet another way of looking at it. If I have a number, say x, which is bigger than 1, then x times x is certainly also bigger than 1. x squared is bigger than 1. Think of x as the fraction absolute value of k minus np divided by an epsilon. The square of this number then is also bigger than 1. And so equivalently, our summation is over all integers k, for which k minus np, the whole squared, divided by n squared epsilon squared is bigger than 1. Every term in that sum satisfies this inequality. If I replace 1 by k minus np, the whole squared, by n squared epsilon squared, for k in that range, then I can only increase the value of the sum. And your immediate reaction is, the man has gotten stuck staring bonkers. He started with a small expression, and now he's made it bigger and worse. How is this in any way useful? Bear with me. We're going to make things a little worse before we make it better. Okay. I've now got an ugly expression, admittedly. True. Okay. Over a range, the red range schematically in your figure, right, for the particular choices n equal to 10 and p equal to 0 0.6. Now, the terms I'm adding are clearly all positive, right? I've got a whole square, which is a positive number, and binomial probabilities, which by definition are also positive. So I'm adding positive quantities. If I add still more positive quantities, I can only make the sum bigger. Right? I can keep making the inequality go in the right direction. Well, which terms can I add? Well, what about all the missing terms, those terms near NP, which I've thrown away? If I include those terms, schematically shown in the green area, then I've added all values k from 0 to n. And then I'll get an even larger number. And again, your reaction is, this is getting crazier and crazier. How is this actually going to lead anywhere? But we're there. Take a look at the denominator. We have n squared epsilon squared. Well, that doesn't depend upon k. Right? So we can pull it out of the sum. So let's say we pull it out of the sum. The moment we do that, we got 1 over n squared epsilon squared times the sum of a square times a binomial probability. Does this in any way look familiar? Does this tickle an atavistic memory? Of course it does. This is exactly the calculation we did for the variance. And if you look at the, at the identity which we had discovered by dint of so much effort in Tableau 10 part 1, we find that that entire sum is just n times p times q. And Abruptly, things have simplified enormously. Cancel an n in the numerator and the denominator. Recall that q is 1 minus p. And we've got an elegant, simple, unexpected formulation. The probability that the relative frequency of successes deviates from p by as small an amount as epsilon or more is no more than p times 1 minus p divided by n epsilon squared. We should take a deep breath and savor this. We have no right to expect something as elegant and so, so simple and so beautiful. This is magnificent. So go ahead, applaud yourself. This is wonderful. Right. Now, admittedly, this is not an exact answer. This is true. We, we now have an upper bound on the probability. That's OK. Let's see what we can do with this. Okay. One other concern might strike the listener. We are trying to estimate the chance that a sample is bad. What does bad mean? That the relative frequency of success is deviates from p by as little as epsilon. It's nice to get an explicit bound on this probability, but the bound depends upon p. And remember, p is unknown. So what use is that? I've got a bound in terms of an unknown parameter. That doesn't help me. We don't seem to have made any progress. 
well, not so hasty. If you've got such a beautiful expression, we should see if this is going to lead somewhere else. Take a look at p times 1 minus p. As p varies from 0 through 1, we've, what we've given is a function of p. And we can actually plot what p times 1 minus p would look like as p varies. And if we did that, we find that we have this beautiful inverted cup for the graph of the function. Of course, a listener who has done some calculus will realize that really I've got p times 1 minus p is a quadratic in p, so I'm going to get a parabolic shape. And indeed I do. Now, an examination of this shows that the largest value for this function occurs when p is 1 half. And at p equal to 1 half, the function takes its maximum value of 1 half times 1 half or 1 quarter. Of course, this is evident in the graph, but if a listener really wishes to, she could write down a function f of p is p times 1 minus p, take its derivative, set the derivative equal to 0, do the usual maximization process in the calculus, and rediscover what we've seen in one fell swoop by just drawing a picture. So here is our lesson. The numerator is not known to us a priori. It is in terms of an unknown p, but whatever it is, that numerator is no more than one quarter for any value of p. And therefore, we've got an even simpler bound. Oh, this is magnificent. Let us take stock for just one moment before we really savor this result. Notice on the left-hand side, we have a probability of a deviation of a relative frequency from the unknown p. On the right-hand side, I've got an expression involving only n, the sample size, and the desired error tolerance, epsilon. p has vanished. Poof! It's gone. We have a result which is uniform in p. Wow, oh, this is transcendent and magnificent. Now let us save it.